hello. Thank you for tuning in to uh, yet another Bible study. Today, we're going to be going through Genesis chapter 38. I have to admit that when uh, I first read through 38 um, a couple weeks ago in preparation for this, um, I was a little bit, uh, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but there was a lot going on there. And I was very curious, well, what, what does this have to do with uh, Joseph? Um, 38, so 37 last week, we looked at Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers uh, and taken down into G uh, Egypt. And chapter 39, we're going to pick it right back up there with him being in Potiphar's household. Um, but 38 is this tangent that, that at first doesn't seem to have any place in it. And it's a rather harsh story of a, a strange uh, interaction where a, a daughter-in-law um, disguises herself as a prostitute and sleeps with her father-in-law and has kids. Um, I mean, it's really, if, when you just read it on the surface level, um, it I don't know if I want to say it's troubling, but it definitely gave me pause, like, what is going on here? Uh, it's not a, a super long chapter, but there is so much in it. Uh, I spent probably twice what I usually spend in prepping uh, for today's study. And so uh, I'm going to pray and we're going to dig into this because there is definitely a reason why this is here. And there are a lot of parallels um, between this and other books in the Bible. And and you'll see when we get to the end of this um, that Genesis 38 is a phenomenal chapter. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you um, are sovereign and that your plan is in place and we can trust in that. Thank you for the story that you tell us in Genesis 38. Lord, I pray that we will uh, be receptive to your word, that you'll teach us something about your character, about who you are, and about how we should interact with you. Uh, Lord, we dedicate this time to you. I love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to read all of Genesis 38 in, in one go, and then uh, we will break it up uh, after that and talk about all of the parallels. Uh, there's parallels uh, in comparison between Judah and Joseph. So Judah is one of Joseph's brothers. Uh, we're going to see a comparison of character there. Uh, 38 is all about Judah. 39, uh, we're going to see Joseph's character come in. But there's also a parallel between Genesis 38 and the book of Ruth uh, in this idea of what is considered a kinsman redeemer and the uh, Levite marriage rule, uh, and we'll go through all of that. So why don't you join me, open up your Bibles to Genesis 38, picking it up on verse 1. <clears throat> At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kezib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would be, not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son, Shelah, grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend Hera, the Adulamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, 
she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she, for she saw that though Shela had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? She asked. He said, What pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adamite in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who live there, where is the shrine prostitute who, who was beside the road to Anam? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who live there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution. And as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shelah. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. And she said, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was named Zerah. Okay, so interesting story, right? Very interesting story. Um, this is a glimpse into the Canaanite culture. And we're going to talk about that. But uh, as is custom, we are now going to go through and look at uh, the, the names and places and the significance um, as they come up. So at this time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adelma, Adelam named Hara. So a few different things here. Um, first of all, we saw in Genesis 37, Joseph be sold into slavery, and he left his brothers. He left his family, um, not of his own accord, not of his own choice. He had no choice in that matter. Here we see Judah on his own leave his family, uh, his brothers, uh, and go to Adalim, which is, um, let's see, it's southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, which that's just interesting is, is that Judah of his own volition leaves uh, while Joseph had no choice. Then he has his friend, Hara. Now, he's mentioned several times in Genesis 38, but that's the only time that he's mentioned. Uh, in the middle of the chapter, chap uh, verse 20, uh, Judah sends Hara uh, to send the goat as payment to the prostitute, but can't find her. Um, he sends his friend on that errand. It's just interesting. It's the only mention of the guy. Um, and there's another interesting, uh, verse two, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. We don't know what her name was. They don't list her name, uh, as far as Judah's wife's name. It's just interesting that, that she is mentioned as Shua's daughter, but they don't name her uh, by name, which is just another interesting fact. So then she has three sons. Okay, so let's go through. 
Uh, before I do that, before we go through the three sons, just important thing to note is, is that this is a Canaanite woman. Uh, and so we know that Shua is a Canaanite man, um, and his daughter uh, is the, the, the woman that Judah marries. Um, as you recall, uh, Abraham was adamant that his son Isaac not marry a Canaanite woman. Then Isaac was adamant that his son uh, Jacob not marry a Canaanite woman. But we see here that Jacob's son Judah uh, leaves the family, goes and marries a Canaanite woman, and has three uh, sons by her, and then two additional sons by Tamar. But the question is, uh, there's two different theories here, is, is that one, the expectation that um, the Hebrews not intermarry with the Canaanites uh, was no longer a precedence, that because um, Jacob had the 12 sons and the family was clearly established, that it, it didn't matter that they be set apart. That's one theory. Um, the other theory and perspective is, is that um, Judah clearly leaves the family and leaves the, um, he intermixes with society. He intermixes with the Canaanite society. And we're going to see um, the practice that he does is, is evidence of that. And of these two theories, uh, you can decide which uh, you want to hold. But when you look throughout Genesis, throughout uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah, um, the Old Testament, Israel was always to be set apart. And even to this day, we as Christians are called to not be of the world, but in the world. We are to be set apart and not be um, uh, in the customs and the habits of the world, which we're going to see that Judah clearly is in the practice and customs of the world. Um, so I just thought that was interesting that um, both Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all three of them, excuse me, um, Abraham and Isaac were adamant that their sons not marry Canaanite women, and then Judah uh, does. So Judah's first three sons are Er, Onan, and Shelah, are the three sons. So as is custom of the time, Judah, the father, finds a wife for his eldest son. That's Er, er excuse me, Er, uh, and the wife is Tamar. Now, Interesting verse, um, Ur is evil in God's eyes, and God's, God kills him. So here is where you see uh, what is considered the, the um, Leverite marriage vow. And this is um, explained in Deuteronomy. We're going to flip there, actually. So leave your finger here. We're going to flip over to Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25. And this is where uh, the marriage law, the Leverite, the Levi uh, marriage rule is established. So Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. Deuteronomy 25, 5. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders of the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill his duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of the town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Interesting. Now, this is in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy is part of uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books that Moses wrote. This happens before this is written, right? So this, as far as the law, has not yet been given to Israel. That happens after Exodus. 
But clearly there is an expectation of this tradition has been set in place because we see uh, Judah marry Tamar, his eldest son's widow, to his next son, Onan. Now, Onan, uh, this, uh, this rule establishes that any sons that Onan has by Tamar will take his elder brother's name. And in doing that, they will also inherit the birthright blessing. This is the inheritance. We've talked about this before uh, with Jacob and Esau, and Jacob swindles Esau out of, and sell, Esau sells it to him for a bowl of stew. The birthright blessing was the inheritance. The eldest son had the right uh, the birthright, which was the inheritance, a 50% greater share of the inheritance and the responsibility of the family name. So if Onan has a son by Tamar, his older brother's dead. So now he has inherited that blessing and, and now is the patriarch when Judah dies right? But if he has a son by Tamar, that son is now in his place as being the inheritor of the family blessing, has the double portion and carries it all on. So we see him uh, not want Tamar to conceive. And so he, he pulls out. He doesn't, uh, um, he doesn't allow her to have a child. God sees this and kills him just like he did his elder brother. Now, some people will use uh, Genesis, um, that verse. Let's flip back um, to Genesis. Some people will use verse 9. Some people will use verse 9 as justification for um, outlawing or saying that uh, birth control is sin. Uh, that either taking pills or using condoms uh, or even doing the strategy that Onan does here is sinful because God kills Onan, um, but Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring to for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. So some people will use verse 10 to say that birth control is sinful and God hates it because he killed Onan for doing that. But you see that the reason, if you just simply read it uh, on surface level, you can see that Onan had selfish intent rather than doing his duty uh, by continuing his brother, his elder brother's line and the lineage. He refuses to do that. And that, I believe, uh, and I think it's, it's the simplest uh, interpretation, uh, is the reason why God kills him is because he's incredibly selfish and doesn't do his duty. So then Judah's third son, uh, Shela, is quite a bit younger. And so Judah says to Tamar, go, be a widow, live in your father's house as a widow. And then when my youngest son, my last son is of age, you can marry him. But we see that Judah has no intention of doing this. He even says... Um, for he thought, this is in verse uh, 11, he may die too, just like his brothers. Uh, Judah believed that the reason why Ur and Onan died was not because they were evil and God killed them, but because that it was Tamar. Tamar was the reason why they died. One of the things that I read actually said that um, there was a belief that if a widow had multiple husbands uh, and continued being widowed, that she was guilty of witchcraft, that she was the one who was killing them and she was responsible. So Judah here, he is fearing his prodigy. He is uh, progeny. He is fearing that his son, his last son, if he allows her to marry Tamar, will also die. And then he will not have any descendants either. So that's where you get into this situation. That's the, the background context of the story here. So then some time passes by. Some time passes by and Shelah, uh, Judah's elder, youngest son, only living son, is now of marrying age. And then what happens is we see uh, Judah takes his sheep up to Timnah. 
to be sheared. Judah is wealthy. He's part of uh, the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant. He no doubt has a lot of sheep, and they're all headed up to Timnah to have them be sheared. He's selling off uh, their wool. And then you see him on his way to Timnah, verse 13, when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enam. Enam is a location which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had now grown up, uh, she had not been given to him as his wife. So a few different things to talk about here. First of all, uh, Canaanite culture at the time. So shrine prostitutes. What this was, let me look at my notes here. So you have um, these shrine prostitutes that were devoted to the goddess Ishtar or the goddess Anat. And what they would do is they'd put a veil on and then they would prostitute themselves as shrine prostitutes. And the reason why they put the veil is it was symbolic of the marriage between the goddess Ishtar and the pagan god Baal, B-A-A-L. And the belief was in that fertility ritual that a man, a specifically a farmer, a landowner, um, who wanted to have a great crop, a great harvest, who wanted to be blessed, would go to the pagan temple and sleep with the shrine prostitute. And in the process of doing that, they believed that the pagan gods would then bless them with wealth. So his uh, sheep are going up to, um, what's the town? Timna to be sheared. And clearly this is a practice of Judah because Tamar knows exactly where he's going to be. It's a Canaanite practice that Judah is clearly used to doing to the extent that his daughter on knows exactly where he is going to be. So she takes off of her, her widow's clothes and then dresses up, veils herself. So he has no idea who he's actually sleeping with and sleeps with her father-in-law. And the reason why she does this is because one of the things that we need to remember is that this is a different culture than we live in today. Clearly, this is a totally different culture. But a woman at this time, specifically a widow, it was requirement of that family to take care of her because there was she couldn't go out and get a job. And then her prospects as far as being able to be married are far lower than if she is a virgin where her father is arranging the marriage. So it is the obligation of the family to take care of the, uh, the sons, uh, their deceased sons' wives, the widows. We actually see this in Acts chapter 6. For those who have been following with us as we've gone through the Bible, we did Acts last year. And Acts chapter 6, you have a discrepancy between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews uh, as, opposed, uh, as it relates to the widows, the widows of the Hellenistic Jews and the widows of the Hebraic Jews. All that's saying is that Acts, the new church has started. And what happened was, is you had widows that were Christ followers. They were Jewish. You had Hebraic Jews, which, which means that they were from Israel and they spoke Hebrew. And then you had Hellenistic Jews, meaning that they spoke Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew. They were not from Jerusalem, but they were culturally Jews that believed in Jesus. They were Messianic Jews. The reason why I'm establishing this and why I'm, I'm, I'm citing Acts 6 is because if you were... A Messianic Jew, if you believed in Jesus in this day, you were kicked out of your family. You were ostracized from your family. And what resulted from that is that the widows, the women whose husbands had died, their families were not taking care of them as they were called to do. So therefore, it became the responsibility of the new church to take care of them. That is the, the whole premise behind why Acts chapter 6 happens. And this is where you see the first... Um, role in the church of deacons and elders, etc. So the, the point that I'm getting at is I want you to remember that from a cultural standpoint, women do not have the independence that they have today. And they were not able, they, they were dependent upon their family to take care of them. So when they married into a family, it was Judah's responsibility to take care of Tamar. So he did the right thing when 
when his eldest son died, when Ur died, and having her marry Onan, but then he didn't do the right thing in having her marry uh, Shayla when he was of age. And so she then, just like Jacob, comes up with a, uh, a way of disguising herself and ends up sleeping with her father-in-law. But from that, from that, there's two sons that are born. And those two sons are Perez and Zerah. And we're going to talk about them in a second. Let me just review my notes. Okay, so uh, one thing that I want to make clear, first of all, is that is this making the argument that prostitution is okay? Uh, in particular, shrine prostitution is what you see here. No, no. Uh, it was a practice of the Canaanites. And we see, if you want reference, Deuteronomy 23, 17, and 18 makes it very clear the Jews were not supposed to have anything to do with prostitutes, either in being a shrine prostitute or in sleeping with a prostitute. It was not okay, it was against the law, which again, as I said, it hadn't been given yet, but the cultural expectation had been set. It wasn't okay, and it's not justification for it now. 38, 16, verse 16, we see uh, Judah say, hey, I want to sleep with you. And Tamar says, uh, he's not knowing that it's Tamar. Tamar says, okay, what do you give me? He says, I'll give you a goat. And she says, okay, well, you don't have the goat with you. What are you going to give me right now as a pledge that I will give back to you when you bring me my goat? And the three things that she give, that he, that Judah gives to the disguised Tamar are his seal, the cord, and staff. So what are these three things? The seal is uh, likely a, a, a a metal or hard press that had his um, seal, his signet on it, and it would be used for contracts. Uh, it was his ID as a wealthy individual. The uh, cord was likely what was used to hold it around his neck. That It was worn around his neck. Then you have his staff. His staff had multiple different purposes. One, it's a walking stick. Two, it's used for self-defense. But three, it was a symbolic element, again, of his position. All three of these things, if held, would clearly identify Judah. You would be able to have his signet, his seal, clearly was unique to him, as was his staff. So in holding these three things, she basically had his ID she had identification of who the man was. So uh, Judah says, yeah, that's fine. Gives her the three things, sleeps with her, then leaves, goes up, takes his sheep, and time passes. Three months in particular pass, and Tamar is found to be pregnant and is presented to Judah. And in verse 24, you see Judah say, bring her out and have her burned to death. That was the punishment for uh, prostitution. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah. And he did not sleep with her again. So a few different elements here. Um, he didn't sleep with her again means that he didn't marry her as his wife. Uh, she was able to stay in his household and had two sons, but he didn't marry her as his wife. And the other thing is, is that Judah says she is more righteous than I. Judah calls out the fact that Tamar is righteous and he is not. He did not do his duty by his daughter-in-law in marrying her to his youngest son. But... Two sons are born to Judah uh, through this whole interaction with Tamar. So Perez, which name, which means uh, breaking out or um, burst forth or breach, uh, the midwife says, uh, but when he drew back his head, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. So that's what Perez means. Now, Zara is the one who actually was being born first, had his hand come out, and she tied a scarlet thread around his wrist. But then Perez pushed his way out uh, and thus became the eldest uh, to have that uh, um, uh, birthright blessing. Zara means uh, scarlet or brightness. 
Okay, so as we look at this, a very interesting parallel exists between this story and the book of Ruth. I highly suggest that you read the book of Ruth. It's only four chapters. It's a quick read. And in it, you, you can actually compare the character of Boaz to Judah. Boaz is an example of what is considered what's called the kinsman redeemer in doing his duty by Ruth. Now, just a little background um, for context to understand. So you have the characters in the story of Ruth. You have Elimelech, who is the husband and the father, his wife, Naomi. They have three sons, excuse me, two sons, two sons. Uh, Malon and Kilion are the two sons. Both of them are married and Orpah and Ruth are their wives. And then as the story goes, uh, Elimelech dies, the dad dies, and then in time, the two sons die as well. This leaves Naomi with her two daughter-in-laws. Naomi then returns to her homeland, and she, Naomi actually sends both of her daughters back to their parents' households as widows, exactly as Judah had done for Tamar. Now, Ruth says, no, I will stay with you. And this is where you get the, the verse, uh, Ruth uh, 1, 16 and 17, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will be my people, etc. That's Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Ruth stays with Naomi and takes care of her and, and lives with her in her house. So they return back to Naomi's homeland. And as you continue reading uh, Ruth 2, 3, and 4, you hear the story of Boaz and this uh, role and responsibility of kinsman redeemer because Elimelech died. So there is a responsibility then for Elimelech's brothers to carry on the responsibility of the Levite marriage law that required whatever living brother the next uh, in line is called to marry um, the wife or uh, take care of um, the widows. And that's where you see the story of Boaz eventually marrying Ruth and redeeming her. Boaz is a picture in being the kinsman redeemer of Christ, redeeming us. We are broken, lost widows without, totally lost without a heritage, without a home. Uh, we aren't citizens of heaven, but God sent his son, Jesus, as our redeemer so that we could be bought back into his household. It, it's powerful. And I actually want to read Ruth. I want to read just a part of it. So flip with me uh, to Ruth, and I want to show you how connected these two books are. So join me, Ruth, uh, Chapter 4, verse 11, Ruth 4, 11. Ruth 4, 11. <clears throat> this is Boaz in front of the um, city gate, in front of the council, basically, of elders. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witness. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. They specifically cite Judah sleeping with Tamar and having Perez right here in Ruth 4, 12. And this is where it gets just awesome. Uh, flip with me to Matthew 1. Flip with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 starts out with a genealogy. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. That brings us to Genesis 38, where we are at in the timeline. Judah 
the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's our story today, Genesis 38. Then follow with me as we see who these descendants are of Perez. Perez, are the, Perez the father of Hizron, Hizron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, it just keeps getting better and better. Ruth and Boaz have a son whose name is Obed. Who's Obed? Obed was the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. <laughs> As I started out with, Genesis 38 just doesn't seem to fit. When it, you know, we're going through talking about uh, Joseph, and we start with Joseph being sold into slavery, and he's taken down into Egypt, and then Genesis 39, he goes into Potiphar's household, and then Genesis 38 is just plopped in, and it's the story of Judah. And at first, it's like, well, why, why, why does this matter? This matters because this is the genealogy of the Messiah. How cool is that? That despite this sinful situation, uh, sinful in the sense of Judah not doing his duty, uh, Judah being a man of the world, clearly following the pagan Canaanite uh, prostitution practices, uh, yet despite that, God's will is done, and Perez is born, and then Perez is in that, that family line, eventually has uh, Ruth and Boaz, whose son is King David's grandfather. And as you continue on in Matthew, uh, skip ahead to verse 15 as you're going through. I don't need to read all of these different um, names, but verse 15 of Matthew 1, Elhud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Methan, Methan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. How cool is that, that, that uh, Tamar and that situation connect through, and through that genealogy, you have the Messiah. Matthew 1 was the very first Bible study that I did as part of what would eventually be, uh, become Iron Sheep. It was June or July of 2020. And as you, if you want, you can go back and watch that. I'll include a link to that on, on YouTube uh, so you can go back and watch this study. The genealogies, Jews were very, very especially in Jesus' day, your heritage as a Jew, if you were able to trace your genealogy back to King David, you were, uh, you were of great significance. But if you were able to trace it back directly to Father Abraham, you were a Hebrew of Hebrews. You were uh, in the succession of who the Messiah was told to be. So Matthew starts out, his gospel, the very first gospel in the New Testament, the very first verses of the New Testament, clearly establishing that family line. And the thing that is so phenomenal about this genealogy is that Jews at this time would, if you had anything of disrepute in your genealogy, you would hide it. You wouldn't want to talk about it. Prostitution, or if you even had uh, a descendant that wasn't an Israelite, you wouldn't want to even mention the fact that they're in your heritage. You would want your genealogy to be pure and clean and Hebrew the whole way through. But when you look at this and you look at these names, Tamar, adultery with her, her father-in-law, then Rahab, who is a prostitute, and then you have Ruth, who's not even Jewish, she's a Moabite. This genealogy, if it was shared with um, the Sanhedrin, with the, um, the Pharisees, would have seen this as a tainted and dirty genealogy because it, it's full of all these uh, broken uh, people that are sinful and prostitutions and non-Israelites. But yet it is through that genealogy that the Messiah is born. And that is the, the, the big takeaway for today. And that is what I love about our Bible is that you have broken people. But despite their brokenness, God can still use them. 
It's this takeaway for today, the application for today. You are broken. I am broken. And yet in that brokenness, God can redeem us and use us. Abraham was not perfect. Isaac was not perfect. Jacob was definitely not perfect. Judah, holy cow. Look at how, how, I mean, a, a man of the world without question. And yet, and yet, God's will is done through them. Because in the sight of God, in the sight of heaven, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, we are righteous. It is through our belief, our belief, we're, we're righteous. In God's eyes, we are pure. We are sinless because of what Jesus did in redeeming us. Join me in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't say it enough, and it just seems so inadequate that you did what you did to redeem us. You didn't have to do it. You didn't have to come down from heaven. You didn't have to come and live as a, a, a human, uh, as a born to uh, in poverty to deal with this broken, fallen world. You didn't have to do that, but you chose to do that. You chose to redeem us. And because of that, I am a citizen of heaven. And all those who believe that are listening or watching this, Lord, they are citizens of heaven. Lord, every day is a new day and that we can, we can fall at our knees. We can admit our failures, admit our sins, and you forgive us. And we are renewed every single day and we are able to be used by you. Lord, I pray that every person who is listening to this or watching this, Lord, that you will light a fire in them to realize that our identity is not in how the world sees us. Our identity is not in how many friends we have on Facebook or Twitter or, or, or what our vocation is or what our wealth is or how our 401k is doing. Our identity must be solely in who we are to you. And in your eyes, we are incredibly valuable and we can be used in whatever situation we are in. You can use us, Lord. I pray that you will give encouragement to those people who are watching and listening to this right now, that despite their situation, redemption is there. All they need to do is turn around, confess their sins, and you are there to help them, to, to change them from the inside out, to be who you want them to be and to be able to be used by you in, in righteousness. We love you, Lord. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we are going to hit uh, Genesis 39, and we're going to see um, the contrast of these two brothers. Judah, we saw in Genesis 38, how he lived in the world and, and the way he lived his life. Genesis 39, we're going to, 39, we're going to see Joseph, and Joseph is going to be tempted, uh, a very strong temptation, and we're going to see how, how he battles and fights that temptation. My homework for you, read Ruth. It's only four chapters. It's a quick read. Read Ruth. And then an amazing study is to look at how is Boaz as the kinsman redeemer, how is he a picture or a type of Christ, an illustration of how Jesus is our redeemer. I love you guys. And I'll see you next week. Hang in there.